thank you, Wendy, uh, for the kind introdu introduction. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad to be here today. Um, I have spent the last six years focusing on the legal issues of mediation. I've written so much that I get bored with it. And at the same time, while I'm doing mediation cases, I have been wondering what am I doing to the parties? And I'm trying, am I trying to find, um, help them to reach settlement agreement? But in the very first place, as I was a, barrister, a practicing barrister, I'm looking for achieving substantive justice in a particular case. Whereas I compare what happened uh, back in 2009 when we have the implementation of the civil justice reform. Both in Hong Kong and in England, we are concerned about problems in the civil justice systems that prohibit access to justice. And there is one question that has been lingering on in my mind for the past six years. And I need to show you how I'm going to find answers to them. And that is, can mediation achieve justice? How can it deliver justice? And in particular, what is the role of the court in monitoring mediation and generally ADR? And hence, I bring to you many materials today. But uh, I'm not going to read out all the PowerPoint um, slides. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the major issues to assist you in understanding this topic. So um, by way of background, in Hong Kong, we always look around in many common law jurisdictions to see how the, the lessons that we can take from them. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the English jurisdiction. Now, over the past two decades, um, the courts of England and Wales has reviewed the civil procedure rules cost as well as the court structure. I'm sure most of you have learned about the Wolf reform, as well as the Jackson reform. Suffice to say that they are all concerned with amending civil procedure rules, as well as the cost rules, in order to improve access to the court. At the same time, uh, we do have the third review given by Lord Justice Briggs. And here you see that in the quote, the Lord Justice Briggs said, the single most pervasive and intractable weakness in our civil court, after all the years of review, remained the same. And that is, we do not have reasonable access to justice for everyone. So these judicial reforms in England pursue one common theme, to enable access to justice through the court, access to the court by everyone. ADR is one of the practical measures being implemented to achieve this aim. But then, as most of, most of us know, it draws skepticism from many academics saying, for example, in particular mediation, it renders substantive substandard outcomes, it may discriminate against the underprivileged, and it may risk undermining the rule of law. At the same time, empirical studies show that disputants hold mixed views on the legitimacy, fairness, and the finality of mediation as well. So on one hand, we have the judiciary and the government trying to promote the use of ADR in order to enable everyone to have reasonable access to the court. On the other hand, we do have some against anti-ADR views from academics as well as mixed views from the users. Now, all the while in the academic literature, and also uh, from the practitioner's point of view, 
We have been focusing on how to promote domestic mediation. We are concerned with improving best practice in facilitative mediation. For me, I think this is not sufficient. There are three thorny issues that the law must deal with. ADR and the concept of justice. What is the relationship between the two? Secondly, how do ADR deliver justice? And thirdly, what is the role of the court in doing so? Now, let's turn to the first issue. What is the relationship between justice and ADR? Um, first of all, um, Fis Owen Fis said that, well, ADR has nothing to do with justice. If you recall your mediation training, we are asking the parties not to look at the law, right? Focusing on interest concern. So FIS says it simply secures peace between the parties. Similarly, again, Hayes again said sim uh, the same thing. In mediation, it does not contribute to substantive justice. However, when we look at um, Empirical and psychological research, the authority is Tyler, and he looked at justice as a social concept. Justice will shape people's actual behavior. And therefore, when he reviewed the recent psychological research on social justice, he found that ADR can achieve subjective justice. There are four primary values of subjective justice based on parties' perceived fairness in procedure. It does not depend on the outcome of the case. So what does it mean by justice according to the parties? First, being having the opportunities to participate in the process. Secondly, um, being assisted by a person that they regard to be um, neutral. Neutral means being impartial, without bias, independent from any party, honest as well as being objective. The third aspect of subjective justice is trustworthiness. So the parties will, be, will assess whether the neutral is benevolent and caring, whether he is trustworthy or not. The fourth aspect of subjective justice is whether the parties were treated with dignity and respect. I will also ask you to look beyond um, psychological research from Tyler and also look at the recent Euro, uh, EU Directive on Consumer ADR. Because uh, when we look at the content, we can see that some provisions also contributed to the meaning of justice in the ADR context. So um, you can see that the major purpose of this directive is to establish ADR entities to assist handling disputes between consumers and traders. So long as these ADR entities meet a minimum set of quality standards, so these kind of quality standards will shed light on justice as well. And um, when I look at articles, six in particular, seven and eight, you will see that some of these standards to be met by the ADR entities, they are influenced by the common law requirement of a fair trial. Article six um, is actually shadows on the right to an independent and impartial uh, tribunal. Article 9, um, again, shows us about it is important to the parties to have the right to be heard and also the right of access to evidence. Article 9, 1b also deals with the right to representation. Article 10 and 12, the right to access to the court. 
So it seems that procedural fairness is an important aspect of justice in ADR context. But there is something more interesting when we look at the EU directive, and that is apart from what we already know about the right to fair trial, it adds some additional quality standards that will affect the effectiveness of the ADR process, which can attain justice as well. And they are the user friendliness of the ADR procedure, accessibility of the um, ADR Institute, um, the cost concerned, as well as the speed as well. In addition, um, because there are several ADR entities to be set up, and therefore the cooperation and exchange of information between them um, may achieve a system of accountability that is absent in the formal justice system. So, in summary, what we have looked at just now is that ADR may achieve subjective justice, procedural justice, and practical justice in itself. In other words, the meaning of justice in ADR may be different, and I argue even broader than that applies in the court. Now, even if ADR can achieve broader senses of justice, bear in mind that the primary purpose of promoting ADR under the civil justice reform is not to ensure that justice is being done through ADR processes. The primary purpose of the CJR is to ensure that more people can gain access to the court. And I quote Lord Neubergers um, in the Keating Lecture in 2010. He said, justice is in a wider sense done. If substantive justice in the individual case is denied or abridged to a certain degree, to me, this quote is very essential. The court um, his lordship actually said extrajudicially, he accepts that justice can be abridged in order to provide equal access to justice through the court. So when we are so bothered by whether we can achieve justice through ADR, the answer is that in the CJR in England and in Hong Kong, the major purpose is not about whether we can achieve justice through mediation. The court accepts that there could be the abridged justice for some. Some of us may not get um, enforcement of our legal rights. The dispute may be settled, but the majority of us who has more deserved cases may have their decisions being reached by the court. And now I would like to turn to ADR and the delivery of justice. Now, uh, if you recall that ADR is still um, having two major views. In particular, the court and the government, they are very, uh, they take the approach of promoting the ADR, how are we going to analyze all these different views? For the pro-ADR camp, they are actually uh, have a tendency to cherry pick some intrinsic values of the ADR processes. All right? So to me, I think that they are focusing on the inherent value of ADR. As you can see by way of example, um, in Lord Wolf's um, interim report, he highlights uh, the usual uh, benefits of ADR, like cheaper, uh, etc. Right? So these are the inherent, intrinsic uh, approach. The same is true in Lord Justice Jackson's uh, review on litigation costs. How about the anti-ADR camp? 
they are not looking at the inherent value of the ADR, but to me, they are criticizing ADR based on an instrumental approach. In other words, treating ADR as a, as a means to an end. So you can see, by way of example, Owen Fisk, he claims that ADR may not produce outcome better than court decisions because he thinks that ADR accepts inequality of wealth as part of the negotiation process. So when disputants are unequally matched, the poorer party could be disadvantaged in settlement negotiation. Whereas in court setting, we try to ensure that there is equality of arms, right? However, um, this is the very first example that look at ADR through an instrumental lens. So apart from inequality of wealth, there is another body of critique against ADR, and we can group it under the left-wing critique. That means they are looking at um, the demand for reducing prejudice against the powerless, the poor, and the otherwise underprivileged. To these um, academics, Abel Oberbach and Hof Richter, they claim that um, because we are now moving from formal justice to informal justice, it is going to encourage the uh, disadvantages of these group of people. From a political point of view, that means the movement from formalism to informalism reflects a shift in power from the less privileged to the more. The informal processes also inhibit social change by concealing disagreements of the have-nots about social and political values in the interest of peace and cooperation. Also, importantly, through these informal institutes, the state extends its control by reviewing behavior that presently escape the scope and handling new types of disputes that touches on new areas of life. We go back to Fis a little bit because apart from what he said just now, he also claims that settlements are not as efficacious as judgments. So in other words, um, for judgments, we can have enforcement procedure, but then um, mediated settlement is quite vulnerable in that regard. At the time of carrying out the obligations of the settlement, there may be unforeseen, unforeseen um, difficulties and change of circumstances that may arise, but then those parties who have reached settlement agreement cannot ask the court to modify their agreement unless um, the settlement agreement has been incorporated as consent, judgments or orders. Now, we have briefly looked at another argument by Fis, is that ADR does not achieve substantive justice, it only secures peace, and again, Hazel can make it more um, in, in the stronger terms, saying that mediation does not contribute to access to the courts, because it is specifically not court-based. It does not contribute to substantive justice because mediation requires the parties to relinquish the legal rights and instead focus on problem solving. Therefore, she said, and I'm sure quite a lot of us will know, the outcome of mediation is not just settlement, it is just about settlement. So when we look at the pro-ADR and anti-ADR views, we do, shouldn't sh stop here. We should consider another additional point, and that is the privatization of civil justice. Here we are concerned with diverting cases away from the court. Therefore, the courts do not have sufficient cases to, to lay down binding precedents, and you can see here, Hazel again continued to assert that the shift from public courts to the private, largely unregulated processes may render substandard outcomes. She claimed that there is no quality assurance in mediation.
So what she's trying to say is that she's speaking a typical argument um, concerning privatization, which compared the performance of a public functionary with that of a private, a private one. Now, what I see uh, from her argument is that um, mediation lacks a dash of legality. And I quote John Gardner's um, in this regard. So we will now move on to the third issue, which is to me the most important out of the three. All the while in the literature we are concerned with what can mediation do about justice? And we have different views. For the um, pro-mediation camp, ADR camp, uh, we focus on the intrinsic inherent value of mediation. For the anti-ADR um, camp, we look at whether it, can, it will further the disadvantage of the underprivileged, whether it can risk undermining the rule of law. But then when we look at all these different views, ADR is not going to go away, right? Both in England and in Hong Kong, it's going to continue. And so what I'm trying to, um, trying to argue is that it is important to have a more central role of the court in ADR. Heisugen actually offers a starting point. Instead of indiscriminately driving cases away from the court, we should be asking what kind of cases should be facilitated back into the court and how we should assist them to do so. In other words, further discussion about promoting uh, and uh, promoting ADR will be futile if they consistently fail to respect the rule of law. So apart from um, improving on the best practice in ADR, we, are, we should be concerned about what kind of cases that the court should handle and also the relationship between judges and the ADR processes. Unlike arbitration, in England, it does not have an act specific to mediation. Even though mediation is the form of ADR that has been substantially promoted since the Wolf Reform. So judges uh, who have been active case managers are required to find ways to enhance the efficiency of civil litigation in light of the overriding objective of the reform civil justice system. We all know about the overriding objective or the underlying objective in Hong Kong. But then if you think about it again from the point of view of the judges, as case manager, they are no longer performing their traditional role. Their traditional role is to understand the law, apply the law to the true facts. What the judges are now doing is that they have broken the traditional divide between court adjudication and private settlement. The court is now trying to assist the parties and ask them to attempt ADR and settle. So to me, it is important to understand that the role of the court change from time to time. It is not a fixed role. The matter is how to change that role in the present context. So judges have intervened into various issues of ADR, including voluntariness, jurisdiction of ADR, time to attempt ADR, and the cost involved. So, from all these case law and practice directions, we understand that the su supervisory role of the court to pretrial ADR has become increasingly obvious. But then it is not a very satisfactory development because it has been done in a piecemeal manner. In other words, judges know that their role has changed already, but then they are 
trying to grapple with their new role. Each has each have different um, direction in so doing. So I look at most of the case law and uh, development in England, and I find that there are two major intervention by judges in ADR. The first judicial strategy is to reduce case law in the civil courts. Why are the judges doing that? Reduce the case law so that the court can free up more time and to handle even more cases. Right? So this is the first and primary judicial strategy. How do the court reduce case load in the court? Asking parties to go away from the court and settle. There are many ways for the court to do so. Just like in Hong Kong, um, for some of the um, cases, PI cases for example, in England, it has many pre-action protocol, pre-action guideline. Before you um, file your case to the court, there are some guidelines to tell you. Litigation should be the last resort. Try to attempt mediation or any other ADR processes. But what if one of the parties refused to attempt ADR? The court is still of the view that it cannot force the parties to do so. Decided in the Court of Appeal case, Horsey, in 2004. And most that they can do is to encourage the use. This is exactly the same position as in Hong Kong. So what can judges do in encouraging and facilitating the use of mediation? and other ADR processes to grant stay. It is a discretionary power. And I would like to highlight a recent decision in England, CIP versus Gulliford Tried Infrastructure. In that case, the party asked for a window of four months, an arbitrary uh, four months. It doesn't matter when I'm going to conduct uh, the ADR process, but I just asked the court to give me four months in order to attempt ADR prior to disclosure. And the judges said, um, it is important to have a sensible timetable for trial, and therefore the court refused to grant such a long arbitrary stay for ADR. Apart from the power of stay, the court intervened um, in a more proactive and vigorous manner in their case management power, depending on the circumstances. Now, I would like to highlight three more cases in this regard. So, um, as, in, as in England and in Hong Kong, the court may help the party to appoint neutrals if the parties cannot agree on which person to pick, right? And in England, it goes beyond that. The power of the court can go to the extent that the court may direct the parties to take all reasonable steps to resolve the dispute before preparing for a trial. What does it mean by take all reasonable steps? It becomes more explicit in the second case that I've quoted here. Judges may even ask the parties to explain what steps towards ADR they have taken explain further why such steps have failed and why some other forms of ADR have not been used. In addition, I think this is more telling, um, in the next case, judges may even compel the parties to submit certain issues to ADR and certain issues um, to court adjudication. Much more proactive in England. So these are the various aspects of case management in encouraging the use of ADR. 
in addition, to me, um, the most strongest, the strongest form of encouragement actually co uh, comes with financial consequences. And um, that is, the court can impose cost sanction if the parties unreasonably refuse to engage in ADR. In England, definitely the case is Halsey because it laid down six factors that the court must take into account to determine whether the parties has reasonably or unreasonably refused to mediate. And just to remind some of you, um, the factors are the nature of the dispute, merits of the case, other settlement methods attempted, cost of ADR, delay, likelihood of success, impact of case management directions. Now, we need to go beyond the Halsey case. It has handed down more than 10 years already. Right? The Halsey guideline of six factors is not a perfect list. The court said it is not exhaustive. And here, I would like to highlight two Call of Appeal decisions to show you how they are being extended. The first is the Chapman case. Now, there was a severely autistic child and her family members filed a negligence claim against the special school for failure to provide the child with appropriate education. The claimant offered to mediate, but then the defendants refused to engage in the process. Subsequently, um, the claim was being struck out for lack of proper particulars and foundation. And costs were so ordered. The appeal upheld master's decision. Here, the Court of Appeal said the defendants could hardly be held to blame. You can see that the school refused to engage in mediation, right? The special school refused to engage in mediation. But then the court was with the school. Why? For their pre-action refusal to engage in the process in this case, they were entitled to see how the claim was eventually made and to take a stand. The problem about the claimant's request for mediation is that it founded because the claimants unreasonably failed to respond to the perfectly proper request for further information that was being sought, particularly as to the non-legal remedies that were desired. There was no response from mother as to her willingness to participate. What it means is that the Chapman case raised two new points upon which the Horsey guideline depends. The first, it adds to the Horsey guideline, the timing of the invitation to mediate is very important. If the proposal to mediate happened too soon, the party being invited, as in the Chapman's case, the defendant in the Chapman case, the invited party has not yet formed a realistic view on the merits so they will be entitled to refuse to mediate without any cost sanction. Apart from proposing too early, if mediation is being suggested untimely, it, re it will render mediation inappropriate and even unnecessary. If mediation is being offered too late, Cost has already been incurred, and um, if we try to engage in mediation, it may intrude trial preparation. So here you will see that the Court of Appeal has already extended the Horsey guideline to tell us that the timing of the invitation to mediate is also a factor that will affect reasonableness in refusing to mediate or not. 
The same case also add another factor that will affect reasonableness. And that is the terms of the mediation proposal. The terms of the proposal, uh, mediation proposal, they are essential to whether the case is suitable for to mediate, and also it will affect the prospect of success. So in the Chapman case, the court goes on, the parties should agree on in the proposal, the issues to be discussed to ensure the presence of the key stakeholders. If you remember, just now I said um, mother was not willing to participate in the process. She was the key stakeholder. In the same mediation proposal, um, it should express willingness to generate creative settlement options and assess settlement options based on objective criteria. And there is another important Call of Appeal case that I would like to draw your attention to, and that is PGF 2 SA versus OMFS. Here we have a freehold land owner trying to um, institute proceedings against a tenant for the breach of repair, repairing covenant. So the claim was trying to make a very serious written invitation to participate in mediation. Suggesting, just like um, I've mentioned just now, the terms of the mediation proposal is quite detailed. Um, exchange of information between experts, uh, valuation, evidence, and so on. Despite the detailed mediation proposal, um, the other party did not respond. It was met with complete silence. So what happened is that the court found silence amount to refusal to mediate because this silence is unreasonable conduct. So I would like to show you here, um, the court extended the Halsey guideline as follows. Silence in the face of an invitation to participate in ADR is a general rule of itself unreasonable. Regardless of whether it is outright refusal, a refusal to engage in the type of ADR requested or to do so at the time requested. What it means to us, what underpins the silence factor is that this case begs for a proper response to the mediation proposal. So to me, this is the third element being added to the Hossi guideline, apart from the the time of invitation, the term of the mediation proposal. Thirdly, it is about whether the response to such mediation proposal is proper or not. Why do we add this element? It is because voluntary mediation assumes that the parties will discuss and work out the detail of the ADR procedure and therefore it requires not just proper invitation to mediate, but also appropriate response to it as well. It required the parties to have effective communication um, about it. So to conclude what we have discussed just now about the judicial intervention to reduce the caseload to encourage parties to take part in ADR, so we have first we have pre-action guideline and then we have courts in the case management meeting to ask the parties what you have done, why the um, ADR steps were failed and so on. And then we have judges imposing cost penalty if the parties unreasonably refuse to mediate. We see that in England it has moved on from Horsey and courts have added different factors to the guideline. Why are the courts doing this? We can see that the use of ADR in the reformed civil justice system is that ADR is no longer solely on the party's free choice. It is not to say that the court is compelling you to do so. But then the court is trying to strike a balance between private interest 
to have the court to enforce the civil rights on one hand and the public interest of faster access to the court for all. That's why we do have cost penalties if you unreasonably refuse to mediate. So it seems that the court has been trying to do a lot on encouragement. If you recall the active case management power, both in England and in Hong Kong, the court does not stop at encouraging, but also facilitating the use of ADR where appropriate. And when I look at the case law development, it seems that the court has not done a lot in the second part. That means facilitation. And we can see from the case law that I've highlighted, it is still up to the parties to determine two crucial factors that may affect the success of ADR. Which one is the best, most appropriate ADR procedure? The court will not tell us which ADR process is the best in the case, right? But then it truly has a bearing, important bearing on the success of ADR. Also, the court will not tell us when is the best time to attempt ADR. But again, as we have, as we have seen in the Chapman case, it does has uh, important influence on the outcome. So these two major questions, which one is the best procedure? When is the best time? Of course, we can leave it up to the ADR industry, up to the mediator, for example, to um, handle these thorny issues, these two tasks. But to me, I think the court may take a more proactive role in so doing. If we look at the current approach, the cost approach is rather broad brush. In the sense that there is only one issue to determine whether a case is suitable for ADR or not. Horsey, in Horsey, the court said most cases are not by their nature unsuitable. So the court is not very helpful, right? Almost all cases are suitable. And we can see that um, in Halsey, it has handed down some examples of exceptions. But to date, no decided cases in England fit into this exceptional category. So the court <coughs> is not helping us on the first question. On, it's not helping us on, on the questions that I posed just now on case suitability. Now, what this means to us is that the risk of not having appropriate cases go to the trial threaten the development of the law, may materialize. If in England, we try to promote the cultural change to engage in ADL more. I would now like to turn to the second judicial strategy on pretrial ADR. The first one was on encouragement and facilitation of ADR. The second one is on providing recoverable cost for engaging in ADR processes. So apart from recovering your litigation costs, the costs engaged in ADR can also be recovered. Last year, Lost Justice Jackson called for an extension of the existing fixed recoverable cost regime from personal injury claim and intellectual property claims to a blanket coverage to all fast track cases up to 250,000 pounds. So that means not just the cases of PI cases and IP cases can get back their own um, AD, uh, ADR costs, but also up to all uh, fast track cases that have the lower reach. So how much can we recover? 
how much ADR cost can we recover? His lordship introduced a grid of great rates minus the disbursement and value added tax, as you can see from the first point here. So, uh, to summarize, the fixed recovery cost for ADR will be about uh, £1,400 to £5,500, ranging from um, ranging about 7% of the value of the claim. Now, um, I would like to draw conclusions from my talk today. Alternative processes have always existed in our civil justice system, long before um, the civil justice reform. There are people who engage in arbitration, mediation, in order to settle their case willingly. But of course, the number may not be as much as uh, we, we may wish. When we look at ADR in itself, can it achieve justice? Answer, yes. It may achieve substantive justice, procedural justice, fairness, as well as practical justice. It depends on, of course, the form of the process. When we look at this second point, it seems that ADR offers a broader range of justice that can be achieved in the court. In the court, we can only achieve substantive justice. But then, the notion of justice is not broadened by um, the ADR's new sense. I am taking an internal standpoint. That means looking at all this from the point of view of a lawyer. The primary goal of pretrial ADR is not concerned with whether ADR can achieve justice or not. The primary goal is to enable more people to have access to the court. That's why all the reforms initiated by the judiciary in England recognize that it is okay that in some cases, substantive justice is not achieved. A breached justice for some may provide accessible justice for more. We need to recognize this Secondly, what is the role of the judge in ADR? Since the judiciary has been promoting, promoting the um, increased use of ADR, does it only ask for parties to engage in such processes? Should it have a more central supervisory role in those processes? Current approach, indiscriminate approach, that means all cases are suitable, almost all cases are suitable. Right? Um, in England, it proposed a solutions court, online court, that will further integrate ADR in the formal justice system. So what is the solutions court in England? It is, being, it is now in the first stage of implementation started with small claims. It will introduce first an automated system. So the parties will go onto the computer, answer several questions, upload several photos and files, and it will change from their story to court documents, pleadings. Second stage, there will be mediation officials, mediator, right, who are not judges but they are in the online court, in the solutions court, suggesting to the parties which is the best, most appropriate procedure to handle the dispute, and suggesting when to do so. So it actually goes on from what I have mentioned just now, 
that the court has not done too well. And that is, apart from encouraging the use of ADR, it actually, the online court tried to facilitate such use. Having the um, non-judge official to inform the parties which one is the best approach and when to conduct the ADR procedure. And if the parties agree, of course, the, the non-judge official can continue with the ADR process. If the parties refuse to engage in ADR, then they will move on to the next stage, and that is they will still um, have the case being tried. But then the court may decide whether or not to have a face-to-face -face traditional form of court adjudication. The court may, in other words, phone the parties, send them emails um, to handle the case and terminate the dispute. So we can see that the UK has already moved on from the case law development about encouraging the use of ADR. It moved on to the facilitation part already, in particular through the uh, establishment of the online court. So, um, to summarize the online court, it will establish a court referral of specific alternative processes for the majority of the small and fast track claims, which is quite similar to um, the 1976 Pound uh, Conference recommendation of a multi-door um, court model. And um, we have mentioned just now, apart from facilitating the use of ADR, um, it also proposed recoverable costs engaged in such processes. It will be about uh, Lord Justice Jackson's recommendation as well, um, no more than 8% of the value of the claim. So to me, it is clear that the court in England continue to support the greater use of ADR, regardless of the mounting criticism from uh, academics about the values that such processes may add. Um, the main weakness of the current ADR initiative is that there is a plausible displacement of the public function of the civil court, which provides a framework of securing the enforcement of legal right and thereby supporting the rule of law. Now, the future reforms, I would suggest, should focus on the relationship between the court and ADR, which has received far less attention than searching for the best alternatives to the parties. So, my final words will be, the theme advocated here is that under the rule of law, the court should play a more central role to support ADR, to enable access to justice. How to do that? The court should ensure, I would suggest, ensure the efficacy, the quality, and the integrity of the alternative processes. Of course, we cannot just burden the court to do all this alone. Legislation may help. And I will advocate for the theme that pretrial ADR plays a supplementary and complementary role through the resolution of disputes. Because without the existing legal framework, it would not um, survive. The outcomes of ADR relies on the judicial enforcement proceedings ultimately. Thank you very much. Um, this is the end of my um, presentation.